Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you everybody for coming to uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Philip Mar, Philip Allen Mar. He comes uh, from the University of Toronto in Canada and uh, he's a PhD student, uh, also uh, worked as assistant uh, teacher in his university and uh, uh, we knew him because um, some time ago, maybe one year ago, uh, he sent us a, um, a request uh, asking for information about one of uh, our papers and uh, he was interested in some formulas, uh, we will see. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, we had some uh, correspondence and uh, few weeks ago, in, in September, he sent us uh, the paper that his advisor, uh, Timothy Chan, mm -hmm. and he uh, had written uh, with this uh, motivation and uh, asked us to, to give our opinion. So uh, our opinion was that uh, we, uh, was, uh, we were very happy to know that uh, some results uh, were applied and we uh, were also very interested in new applications and repercussions. So uh, we invited him to come here and say, why don't you tell us what you have done and we have some discussions. And this is why we are here and we are enjoying his visit mm -hmm. very much. So uh, please uh, tell us uh, okay. what you did. Uh, okay. here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Juan. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, joint work with Timothy Chan at the University of Toronto. And the work is entitled Stability and Continuity in Robust Linear and Linear Semi-Infinite Optimization. And I'd like to say a special thanks. Uh, I thank God very much for uh, the, uh, Juan and Javier and Lola and uh, Maria kind of has, uh, for all their, all their work, because I think none of this would have been possible without their, without their Lipschitz constants and everything. So you'll see, uh, I'll be quoting a lot of your papers throughout, or citing a lot of your papers throughout the, throughout the presentation, okay? Uh, so thank you everyone again for, for coming to listen to this talk. Okay, so structure of this talk, today I'll go through the background and goals uh, I'll uh, go through the motivation for why this research is relevant. Um, I'll overview some of the results that we came up with. Um, in particular, there are three and I'll, I'll outline them later. And then I'm going to zoom in on a particular one, Lipschitz continuity of the optimal value for robust optimization problems. And I'm gonna uh, give a proof sketch and a bit of the proof details that we go through for this. And then I'll, I'll sum up with a conclusion and how we generalize this to uh, a more general setting. Okay, so uh, a review of robust optimization. So let's begin with a nominal problem, a problem with only a particular amount of parameters. So let's look at this single constraint uh, linear optimization problem. So let's say you have a nominal problem that has a particular cost function, coefficient vector, and right-hand side. You can generate an optimal solution x star given this particular choice of parameters. However, if some other parameters are realized, if some other parameters are the actual ones, say like the C bar, C bar ones, A bar one, and B bar, B bar one, if these other values are realized, this X star that you chose might be non-optimal or even infeasible, okay? So the way practitioners usually take this to, into account is either through stochastic programming or through another methodology called, we, which we call robust optimization. So robust optimization was uh, pioneered uh, basically by Bental and Nambarovsky in, in the, I, I believe in the early 90s and they really popularized the methodology. So you, ch you choose an uncertainty set that encapsulates all the particular parameters that you want to take into account. So robust optimization is a methodology that accounts for uncertain parameter values using uncertainty sets, okay? So the problem formulation is as follows. You have the same with the cost function and the, the constraint vector. However, this time you, you say that it has to hold for all possible parameters that can be realized in the uncertainty set U. So the, the, the decision maker has to choose the uncertainty set U. So, in particular, the choice of U will affect the optimal value. Uh, this is clear. So if I choose this uncertainty set and you minimize it, this one has fewer constraints than this uncertainty set. This uncertainty set is larger and therefore there are more constraints 
and therefore the optimal solution is going to be slightly higher, slightly worse. If I choose another uncertainty set that's not neither a superset nor a subset, I don't know what's going to happen, right? So there's no clear delineation of how the optimal value is going to change. Okay, so our motivating question is this. How does the optimal value of a robust optimization problem change with perturbations to its uncertainty set? So I've drawn it schematically here. Let's say on the x-axis you have some parameterization of your uncertainty set. And on the y-axis you have an, your optimal value, okay? So what happens is if I parameterize the uncertainty set and I change it slightly, smoothly, based on this parameter, does the optimal value change kind of discontinuously as in this case, or does it change smoothly? And if it does change smoothly, does it change very smoothly like this, very slight changes, or does it change very rapidly like this? So this is the fundamental question that we're looking at. Okay, how does it change with the respect to the uncertainty set? Okay, a bit of a literature review. So I have two sets of literature. The first one is uh, looking at convergence of the optimal solution sets in robust optimization with respect to changes in, in the uncertainty set. So I have Ver Werner and Chan and Misich. Uh, they looked at these, these two papers looked at convergence of the optimal solution set in the limit of uncertainty sets that are singletons. So they're basically point uncertainty sets. And Moazeni et al. in 2013 looked at regularized uncertainty sets. So these two, um, we're going to try to generalize these works. So these are, so far it seems like it's very sparse in the literature. Uh, Werner and China Misich were going to generalize by not looking only at singleton limit sets, but we're also going to look at general compact and convex uncertainty sets. And for Moazeni, we're not going to look at only regularized uncertainty sets, we're going to generalize and look at um, compact and convex uncertainty, uh, uncertainty sets in general. Uh, a few other papers, Bental and Nemirovsky looked at sensitivity uh, analysis. Uh, look at this from a sensitivity analysis viewpoint. So Bental and Nemirovsky looked at the difference between the nominal problem and the robust problem. And Elgawi and Crespi looked at this from a well-posedness, different notions of well-posedness uh, in terms of robust optimization. So this is just li uh, literature review. Okay, so if we look at continuity and robust optimization, we want to get an intuition by just looking at an analogy to calculus. So continuity at an uncertainty set u means that for all sets v1 and v2 that are close to u in some sense, uh, that the values new ROV1 and new ROV2, which are the optimal values with these uncertainty sets, they're close to this uncertainty set uh, new ROU. Okay? So in particular, we show Lipschitz continuity, which is slightly stronger than just general continuity. There exists a Lipschitz constant L, such that for all V that are close to this neighborhood of U, the optimal values are bounded linearly by their Hausdorff distance from each other. Okay, so this Lipschitz constant should look familiar. It's actually from uh, Lola Juan and uh, Javier's paper, okay? And this, this is where we derive this Lipschitz constant, okay? So Hausdorff distance, again, we're a view. The reason why I chose Hausdorff distance is because it can encapsulate both the shape parameter and the, the distance between the uncertainty sets. So that's particularly why we chose it. So also, it generalizes what we mentioned before, where there is no particular convergence rate in this one, okay? So this is a quantitative result for the optimal value. Okay, so our contributions are as follows. We prove stability results for robust linear optimization problems, one with a Lipschitz continuity of the optimal value. So this is new in the area of robust optimization. And, um, and secondly, we show upper semi-continuity or end closedness of the op optimal solution set. So here the uncertainty set need only be convex and compact, no restriction on the type of convergence or the limiting set. So uh, just a further qualification, yes, we do make an assumption, a Slater condition type of assumption and that the optimal set is um, uh, bounded in non-empty, but that, that's, you know, you can argue that's more a, a quality of the optimal, of the optimization problem, not so much on the uncertainty set, okay? Um, but it still does constrain the uncertainty set in some way, but that's just a disclaimer. Uh, third, uh, the Lipschitz continuity of the approximate optimal solution set, the epsilon approximate optimal solution set, this is also new. So we, these two are new, this one we generalized in some sense from the other previous papers. Um, and the reason why we chose these ones is because there's something that has been well studied in stochastic optimization, which is a cousin of robust optimization. Neither one is a subset or superset of the other, but it just, we found it strange that, you know, this is a very fundamental, these are very fundamental stability properties that haven't been really explored in robust optimization. So we wanted to fill that gap in the literature. 
Okay, so, uh, so our results parallel the results from linear semi-infinite optimization and variational analysis. So the first two come from uh, very own from here, this university. Uh, this kind of us, uh, at all 2006, they show Lipschitz continuity at the optimal value for LSIO problems. Uh, they all, we also find that there's upper semi-continuity and closeness of the optimal solution set for LSIO problems. This one is uh, Gaberna 1996, Canavas et al. Uh, 1999. So these, these two papers uh, are where, we, do, where we, uh, we use to get our upper semi-continuity and closeness. Uh, finally, we show Lipschitz continuity of the epsilon approximate optimal solution set for unconstrained convex problems, and this comes from uh, results in the Rockefeller and Wetz textbook. I, I'm not sure if it came from the first edition or the second edition. I think they might have added this in the second edition. I'm not sure. Yeah, so yeah, some, this yeah. One is mm -hmm. 1998. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1998, and I think so. They extend a result from Atush and Wetz, I think, from 1993, also for the epsilon approximate solution set. So what's interesting here is that LSIO problems can actually be written as proper lower semi-continuous convex functions. So if you, if you take the, the, the constraints from the LSIO problem and you put it as a characteristic function into the convex function, you still retain its proper and lower semi-continuity of it, as long as, the, you know, as long as the constraints are convex. So this, this we used to, ex um, to get this result. And basically what this, uh, this result takes the place of these two in the case of the approximate optimal solution set. Okay, uh, is it still okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So linear semi-infinite optimization problem. Uh, I can just go with this really quick. Um, basically, the constraints are just you have an infinite number of them. So there's the same thing as linear programming. Um, but here, I guess the main highlight here is that what I really liked from your paper was that this t was an arbitrary index set. So this is something that was really uh, was basically our, our main insight was this t was an arbitrary index set, and from this we can we can make analogies to the robust optimization and then translate the robust optimization into this world directly. So this arbitrary non-topological, no, no topological structure was very useful for us. Uh, just as a notation, this constraint system with sigma uh, in the set uh, capital sigma, I just denote it here, and the problem is pi with the set uh, pi, okay? Um, so here, here's our main idea. Here's our main idea for how we use LSI results in the robust optimization world, okay? So robust optimization problems have an infinite number of constraints, excuse me, uh, that is they belong to the class of LSIO problems. They're a particular class. Uh, and second, there are stability results for LSIO problems, the, the ones we listed earlier, okay? Uh, so our main idea is we want to map each robust optimization problem to an equivalent LSIO problem and use LSIO results. Okay, so how do we map RO problems to LSIO problems? Simple, you just, you just index the constraints in the RO problem. Okay, so you index each of the RO problems, you give it a particular indexing, and it becomes an LSIO problem. Okay, so this seems, uh, this, the high level idea is fairly intuitive and fairly simple. However, there's a main challenge. What's the main challenge? Okay, so if you, the main challenge comes from the fact that RO and LSIO problems are different in construction. Okay, they're different in, in the way they're, they're usually formulated. So RO problems, if you notice here, you have this uncertainty set U, and LSIO, they're, they're indexed by this, this set T. So I'll just outline the features. LSIO problems are usually measured against a common T. So if you measure two LSIO problems and you measure their distance from each other, they have to be set or placed in a particular index, common index set T. So you can think of this index set T as like a, uh, a standard uniform metric, right? A standard like, you know, SI units or whatever for, for the index set T, right? So this is something that all LSI problems are measured against, or they're only relevantly measured against each other with a common index set T. And a second challenge is that one RO problem is equivalent to infinitely many LSIO problems, okay? So each of these RO problems, you can just rewrite them in any other way in, in an uncountably infinite number of ways into an LSIO problem, right? This is, this, is, this is kind of intuitive. Like, you just rearrange, you can rearrange the ordering of this RO problem, and it's still the same RO problem, but you can have completely different LSIO problems. Okay, so in summary, there are two challenges. So the first, measuring distance between two RO problems with LSIO metrics requires a common index set T. So first we have to find this index set T. If you have two RO problems like with an uh, uncertainty set U and an uncertainty set V, you have to still find a common index set T for which you can measure these two, these two RO problems. Okay, so that might be, that's, that's the first challenge, it's difficult. 
Uh, the second challenge is that measuring distance between two RO problems does not immediately correspond to measuring the distance between any two respectively equivalent LSIO problems. So if you have two RO problems, you have an infinite sequence of LSIO problems here, but measuring these two doesn't really me mean the same thing as measuring these two. So you can, me you can measure them in a, an infinite number of ways. You just have to combine different LSIO problems that you're comparing, right? Because each RO problem is compared to two different ones. So we have to choose the right ones, the right LSIO problems that you can compare to get a meaningful distance between them, okay? So uh, yeah, that's the, that's the main idea. Okay, it's just a summary of the linear semi-infinite optimization problems, the distance metric that is used. Basically, what you do is you have two LSIO problems and you have their list of constraints. And the way you measure the distance is basically you take, take index-wise their distance, okay? You take the index-wise and you take the supremo over all the, all the distances. And then secondly, you wanna get the distance metric of all the problems, you just include the cost function. So you get the cost function and you get the constraints as well. So the main, um, the main insight here is that indexing really does matter. Indexing affects the distance between LSIO problems, right? So just as a really quick illustration, just to, uh, is, this is kind of obvious. So if you have two LSIO problems, sigma one and sigma two, and you have their constraints, the same constraints in the exact same order, one, zero, zero, one, the distance is obviously zero. If you change the order of the constraints, you can get a completely different distance, right? Because you're, you're measuring them index-wise, right? Okay, so that's fairly intuitive, like the indexing does matter and the indexing of your constraints does make a huge difference. So this is our main challenge. Okay, so here's a notion to take that into account. Basically, uh, I've defined what I call sigma equivalent and pi equivalence. So sigma equivalence denoted sigma one uh, equivalent to sigma two if their constraints are, are the same up to a reordering and a multiplicity. Okay, so this, as long as their constraints are basically exactly the same. but Note that this is a, this, having their constraints and their cost functions the same is, is a bit is stronger than merely having their feasible region, their optimal solution, and their optimal solution sets being the same. So basically, you could have two LSIO problems that have exactly the same optimal solution set, optimal value, but they're not pi equivalent. So how, how can we see this? So let's say you have two sigma equivalent problems that exclude the constraint 0x greater than, greater than or equal to 0. So 0x greater than or equal to 0 is a trivial constraint. It doesn't change your feasible solution at all. Okay, if I add that constraint here into this second problem, and it's not in this one, sure, their optimal value, optimal solution set, feasible solution sets are still this, exactly the same, because you haven't changed the feasible solution set. However, the, the, sigma, the sigma equivalent is completely different, so they're not equivalent, right? Okay, so this is, so the reason why I introduced this is, is that it's important for a true continuity result. And in particular, sorry. In particular, we have, uh, this Lipschitz invariant is for LSIO problems. So this Lipschitz constant that uh, um, you guys found in your, in your paper, this Lipschitz constant is invariant with respect to the pi equivalents. So pi equivalent problems, um, they're not, they're equivalent, their Lipschitz constants are equivalent. So this is very important later for, uh, for to show that it's a true continuity result. So just, just um, I'll, I'll show it later. So this is, this is interesting because actually this Lipschitz constant that, uh, that is calculated, when you, when you look at the calculation, all of them depend on topological features of the constraints and nothing in particular on the, on the, on the ordering, okay? So that's, that, that was one of the insights that we got. Okay, so this is the theorem from Canavas et al. 2006, published in Math of OR, I believe. Um, and so basically, you have this pi naught, which is in the interior of the solvable region. If these two problems, pi one and pi two, are close to each other, close to this pi naught, then the optimal values are bounded linearly by their delta pi, or their, their delta pi, their Lipsch, uh, LSIO distance where this L dot is a constant that can be calculated. So in other words, this theorem states that problems pi one and pi two, provided they are solvable enough and they are close enough together, have their optimal values bounded linearly by their delta pi distance. So when I mean solvable, I, mean, I just mean that their optimal values are finite, okay? Uh, yeah, so they're, they're bounded linearly by their delta pi distance, okay? So ha, again, I mentioned that we do this transformation between robust optimization and LSIO problems, uh, basically by indexing the constraints in the uncertainty set. Okay, so this is an example. So our goal is to construct LSIO problems that are delta pi close to each other by indexing the uncertainty sets. 
And this can be difficult even in the finite case, okay? So just as a conceptual example, let's say I have two uncertainty sets, U and V in the robust world. And I want to index each of, I want to index basically just the vertices, right? I only, it's sufficient to index the vertices in order to get an uh, LSIO problem. So I'm indexing the vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six, same with the V. And if I index it this way, remember the LSI metric is measured index-wise. So I measured index-wise here, and I think the distance, the biggest distance is here, six. So this six would, would uniquely determine, characterize the distance between the LSIO problems. This is a good indexing because the delta pi is very small. Okay. However, if I permute the indexing for V, I get a different distance, and I think the biggest one here is four, right? This one is very large. So this is bad, so indexing does matter, right? <laughs> okay, so here, the key idea is that we construct an explicit RO LSIO transformation. Given two RO problems, ROV and R ROU and ROV, construct respectively equivalent LSIO problems, this one, so that the optimal values are the same, and this delta pi metric is equ equal to the house surf distance. So in other words, it's a, it's a linear, um, is it a linear isometry? No, just, a, just an isometry between the two spaces, between the, space of, uh, uh, between the spaces of uncertainty sets and the spaces of linear, uh, linear semi-infinite optimization problems. We basically construct an isometry that is uh, a bit stronger because we also require the equivalence. Okay? And the way we do this is uh, in response to the challenges. So the first one, we choose the index set to be the space where the uncertainty sets live. Okay, so this, this is Rn because we're only looking for now at uncertainty in the, con the constraints, in the, uh, the coefficient vectors. We're looking only at the coefficient vectors. So here this T will live in the same space as where the uncertainty set is. So basically you have your space of uncertainty sets. We create a parallel universe, a parallel space that's exactly the same, okay? Um, so here I have, uh, I'll, I only have to define for the constraints. So the, the constraints, basically this T lives in this set T and we're going to parallel basically exactly where the uncertainty sets are. So if the index is in exactly the parallel of the, of the uncertainty set U, we choose exactly the same constraint. Okay, so that's intuitive. If it is outside of the uncertainty set U, but inside of the other uncertainty set V, we choose the closest point in U to that set V. Okay, so this, this one, um, and this argument is actually going to be unique because I chose U to be compact and convex. This, this argument is going to be a unique singleton set. So there's a piece of notation here, but okay. And this last one, if it's neither in U nor V, I just try to pass it to a trivial constraint. So this uh, row is going to be a positive value and I pass it to a trivial constraint. Okay, and same with this uh, sig sigma VU, it's exactly the opposite, okay? And the, the reason why this is nice is because if you take the Lipschitz distance between them, the LSIO distance between, so not Lipschitz, if you take the LSIO distance between them, this one actually gives you exactly the house of distance. So this is just by construction, okay? Okay, so now, um, so here's a picture of it. Here's your set U, if it's, out, if it's inside U, you choose the same one. If it's outside, you choose it close to it. If it's, out, if it's in, either, in either of them, you choose it outside. So you see how this constructs exactly the house, the house of distance, okay? Okay, so here's our theorem. Here's just using that transformation, we, use, we construct this theorem. So let's just continuity of the optimal value. Let u be a compact and convex subset of Rn, the uncertainty set of the coefficient vector only. Okay? Suppose the following condition holds the problem ROU satisfies a strong Slater condition. Uh, the set of optimal solutions of ROU is non empty and bounded. Excuse me. Then there exists an LSIO problem, which we denote pi of u, such that for all v, close enough to you in the house of distance, we have that the optimal values are bounded linearly by the house of distance for some Lipschitz constant L u of epsilon, okay? So just as a side note, I just learned of today that this is, uh, another word name for this is calmness. So we're not looking at uh, Lipschitz, con we're not only looking at co Lipschitz continuity, but if we, if we somehow take the limit of this to, take the limit of this, uh, you, of the neighborhoods, you can actually get a calmness quant quantity. So, a co um, yeah, that could be an interesting, like, extension of this as a calmness, calmness uh, properties of it, yeah. Okay, so this is the, this is our, 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 our theorem. Um, and I just wanna, I just wanna go through like a proof sketch of, of what we had. And, and basically this boils down to two fundamental um, 
properties that I, I, I we mentioned. So the first one is that the Lipschitz constant is invariant with respect to pi equivalent problems. So that's 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 one of the main properties. Okay, and the second property that we found was basically this idea of of Finding aleatorial problems that are equivalent and that their house, their it's basically an isometry between the space of uncertainty sets and the space of um, uh, of of LSIO problems. Okay, so those those are the two main properties. And and uh, in the theorem, I'll, I'll I'll use those two two main kind of lemmas. Okay, lemma. Okay, so uh, I have a proof sketch. This is a picture that, uh, picture where you have on the right hand side you have the space of uh, uncertainty sets and here you have the space of LSIO problems okay and so here's how here's how the proof will proceed so first we're going to have an uncertainty set u and we're going to ch we're going to construct one LSIO problem that is equivalent to it this pi of u over here and this red line denotes uh, is a schematic for all the problems that are equivalent to it or pi equivalent to, to this pi u okay and we're going to construct all the ones that are, we're going to construct this particular pi u v um, so we're, sorry, we're going to get this uncertain. We're going to get this neighborhood for which we can choose any v within that neighborhood. Okay, and from this u, we're going to choose the all the problems that are equivalent to it, and we're going to choose pi u v and pi v u that are close to each other. Okay, in particular, they're close enough to each other so that we can apply uh, the theorem from uh, your your paper from two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And once we get this, we find that the optimal values are close to u and v. Uh, the optimal values of pi u v and pi v u are close to each other based on some Lipschitz constant. However, this Lipschitz constant is fundamentally dependent on this pi u v still, right? We want to get rid of the dependence on v in order to ensure its true continuity result. And the way we do that is by noticing that pi u and pi v u are pi equivalent, and so we can get rid of the dependence on v. Okay, so then. That, that's the last step and we get the pi uv. And so because these ones, these two LSIO problems have the same optimal values as ROU and ROV, then we have the, the result that we wanted, okay? Okay, so again, proof steps, we define pi u, choose this epsilon neighborhood from which we can choose v, define pi uv, define pi vu, due to the RO LSIO mapping, these two, is it a, it's an isometry. Using LSIO results from steps three, four, and five, to obtain this kind of inequality, and then we note that because they're pi equivalent, this Lipschitz constant is independent of v. Okay, so that's that's the total proof. Okay, so here's a here's a picture. Um, let's see what what's not shown here is that. Okay, so basically we choose this pi u, which is an LSIO problem, which is equivalent, um, and we notice notice that this this LSIO problem is exactly equivalent to the RO problem because we have all the constraints in U are also uh, appearing in the constraints of, of the LSIO problem and everything that's not in the, con not in, the LSI in the RO problem appears as a trivial constraint in the LSIO. So they have the same feasible set, optimal set, and optimal region. Okay, so that's one. Second, we choose the, uh, this, this neighborhood. So in particular, there's, there's some proof here where we show that this is in the, the recall I had the Slater condition. The, Slater, the strong Slater condition ensures that it's inside the solvable region. So I've drawn inside interior of the solvable region. So in particular, we can choose this epsilon, which is the distance to the boundary. And we have this distance uh, between these uncertainty sets, u and v, where you can choose this v, which is independent of the neighborhood. Well, we can choose a v that's independent of the neighborhood. Okay. Now I define this pi u v, uh, again, where I get this definition, which I mentioned before. Again, this one is going to be uh, unique because this U is compact and convex, and this is an, uh, I'm only using a Euclidean norm, so in this case, so yeah. it has all the strong convexity properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then define pi VU, same thing, and then I use this step five, which is this house strip distance. So just in a bit more detail, um, if, if T is in U and V, recall the way we defined it, you're gonna have exactly the same. Um, however, if you have T that's in U, not V, the way it's defined is so that you get exactly sup min of this distance, which is exactly the house surface distance, right? Uh, if you add in the extra V part portion here, you're, you're not adding any distance. Okay, so same thing with the other one. So now you have this zero min V, min U, U, U minus T, and this is exactly the house surface distance. Okay, so this is, this is the nice part, okay? So you have this distance. 
And the one last step that I mentioned before is we have to ensure that this Lipschitz constant is independent of V. Otherwise, you don't really have a continuity result, right? You just have bounds. So this Lipschitz continuity result you get because pi uv and pi u have exactly the same, con they're pi equivalent. They have exactly the same constraints. And they only depend on the topological properties. Okay, so we have the sequence of inequalities. We have this equality by choice of pi uv and pi vu. They have the same optimal values. You have the Lipschitz uh, continuity by the LSI results. Uh, you have this isometry equivalence, and then finally you have this independence because of um, this pi equivalence. Okay. Okay. So additional stability results. So I just proved for the single constraint optimal value, um, but we've also developed this for this L R O L S I O transformation that was developed is also used in the proof of upper semi-continuity and closedness of the optimal solution set. So this is proof from the definition of upper semi-continuity and closedness. And you can look at this, uh, you can look at the proofs of this on the preprint that we have up on archive um, under the same title as this talk. And second, we show Lipschitz continuity of the approximate optimal so solution set proved by specializing variational analysis results to the LSIO setting, okay? Okay, and in particular, we look at this in the multiple constraint case. The stability results for the optimal value, optimal solution set, and the approximate optimal solution set also extend to the cost and right-hand side value uncertainty, okay? And the multiple constraint case, so in the form of, of this. So uh, I wanna note that this one, uh, this i can actually be uncountably infinite. So in particular, we've shown this for, uh, we've shown continuity for robust uh, linear semi-infinite optimization problems as well, okay? So I think this is in Gaberna's uh, definition, I think chapter 14 or something from their, from their textbook where they define an uncertain, uh, robust, uh, sorry, they define, yeah, robust linear semi-infinite optimization problems where the constraints, where the uncertainty is constraint-wise. So I think it gets really messy when you, when you, get, when you have this constraint, when it's not constraint-wise, uh, and that's, that can be uh, new future work how, how, to get, how to take into account like non-constraint-wise problems. Um, and it's interesting actually because constraint-wise actually does encapsulate their equivalent, having non-constraint-wise uncertainty sets is actually equivalent to the constraint-wise uncertainty sets. And I, I think there's, there's some subtlety there with respect to how the, the stability is actually defined, right? Be, if you have a square or not. Right. Okay, so summary, we proved the following stability rate properties for oral problems with respect to changes in the uncertainty set. Lipschitz continuity of the optimal value, upper semi-continuity and closedness of the optimal solution set with relaxed assumptions on the uncertainty set, Lipschitz continuity of the approximate optimal solution set. So those are the three things we've looked at. So just future work, this is, inter this is kind of the place I wanted, to, I wanted to get to, especially since a lot of, a lot of your work is uh, in this area as well. Mm. So, oh, so ooh, okay, sorry. It works for robust linear semi-infinite optimization problems. Can we extend this to optimization problems? So this is kind of interesting because every convex problem is in, you can rewrite as an envelope of LSIO problems. And so I think in some preliminary work that we were working on, one of the problems that we encountered in this one is because we don't really know how to define uncertainty in a convex setting. Like how do you define it? I was looking at like sub-differentials or something. It, might, it was kind of difficult and it, it's interesting to look at where this can actually work. Where, where, how can we define convex problems that are both theoretically tractable or meaningful and uh, meaningful from an application point of view? You know, how, how can we write convex functions with an uncertainty set? Second, can we, we can calculate this L, U, epsilon explicitly, but it can be really difficult, right? So if you look at the 2006 uh, Kanabaset Al paper, this one depends on a very on topological properties of the paper of of the constraints. So we were looking at looking at this for the case of like the ball and the 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 ball that's not centered at the origin, and it's already been very like very hard to calculate. It's a it's a fun problem for me. It's a fun problem too because there's a lot of like um, you know distance metric and calculus kind of arguments, and it's 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 an interesting problem that 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 would be kind of one area of future work. Uh, what can be said about stability when we include equality constraints? So this is not just for this robust problem, but in general, how can we look at equality constraints from a linear semi-infinite optimization viewpoint? Because in particular, when you have the equality constraints, you lose the strong Slater condition. So there's no, there's no way to really handle that, but maybe there's a way to look at like in a subspace, if you look at perturbations within that particular subspace. Okay, so this last one, um, this last one was very interesting, which was brought up to me by a colleague. Um, 
who used to work at our lab but now is in MIT, um, Peter Yun Zhang, he mentioned this one. And what, what his idea was that uh, in, this, in this work, we kind of had each LSIO problem, they had a metric and we've abstracted it using pi equivalents, right? And so what was interesting, uh, and this will be my last point, sorry. Um, what was interesting is we wanted to look at, if, is there a way to look at pi equivalents as an equivalence relationship, right? So let's say you have your, uh, is it okay if I, I write here? Okay, so this delta pi metric, pi one and pi two, what, what we've done basically is that we've looked at the equivalence class. Uh, this is the notation for equivalence class, right? Equivalence class with respect to this pi equivalence, um, pi equivalence, and we looked at this pi two with respect to pi equivalence as well. Um, is there a way to get the infimum of pi and pi prime, uh, pi in the pi equivalence of pi one, um, and this pi prime in the equivalence of pi two, this infimum pi one and pi two. Because that's essentially what we've done here, right? I, I mean, ours is somewhat in between this one and, and this delta pi one, pi two, right? And so if we're able to get a way to get this infimum over all the equivalent problems, right? It, recall I had this picture where um, I had this pi s and I had these two problems and I had their, their you know, their, their sets that are close to each other. I, I kind of, we, we chose two of them because it was convenient for the RO problem. But as an extension, right, can we make this even shorter? Is there a way to get like the closest two points to get this infimum distance? And maybe there's a way to define this infimum distance because, in re, because even in the linear programming case, we don't really, in, in the finite constraint case, we don't really make a distinction between them, right? But in this case, for some reason, the delta, uh, delta pi metric is defined with a distinction in the ordering. So basically I want to, we, an interesting direction would be maybe looking at how, how these um, distances would look if they're not related to their ordering. Right? So that's just a, a, another idea um, for future work. So as an extension or in the same flavor as this RO problem. Okay? Uh, yeah, so here are some references. Uh, yeah, this one, this one from, actually a lot of them. <laughs> All, all from yeah, univer from this university. Yeah, so thank you very much for taking time for listening to this talk. Uh, I'll be open to questions. Is there any question or remark on this? Some questions? Quick congratulations for your topic. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, could you talk uh, just a bit about the real world applications of a uh, robust optimization? Because uh, as, a, as far as I know, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, problem is uh, motivated by some problems in okay. different uh, areas. Yeah. Just a uh, okay. small uh, speaking about uh, okay, sure. uh, real application that as you know. Okay, sure. Uh, so let me. Um, let me write out a, an application. Um, so let's look at, um, you're all familiar with radiation therapy for cancer. So let's say you have this uh, tumor in, in a healthy body. Oh, this is dying. Okay. So let's say this is a, a tumor and this is your healthy, healthy tissue. So in our case, it's like the lung. So lung motion is uncertain. So you can have people breathing like, or you know, like breathing un in an uncertain way. And so uh, the, radi what, the way radiation therapy works, in particular what is called intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT. So this is the work that my supervisor did for his doctorate. Um, if you have radiation beams that come in, these radiation beams have, uh, sorry, W. These radiation beams basically are modulated this becomes an optimization problem you want to choose the you want to basically choose these vectors of radiation so that you minimize damage to this uh, you you minimize damage to the healthy tissue while maximizing damage to the to the tumor as much as possible okay so in particular when the motion is uncertain or when the motion is certain or one directional you can get uh, a, a linear optimization problem a, a linear programming problem Okay. However, if your motion is uncertain, you have to generate some uncertainty set. 
an uncertainty set. So this uncertainty set U. Okay. Um, and so what my supervisor did was what Tim, what Tim Timothy Chan did basically was you have an uncertainty set U that um, determines the different motions, and you use linear you use robust optimization to get it. And what uh, Valibor Misic, which is a former student of Tim's, who's, who's also at MIT uh, right now, he's doing his doc, he's doing his doctorate. Um, what he does is, if you have, so radiation therapy plans are not applied on one day. You have to go several days in several days over time. So you do, th I think it's a 30-day treatment plan. So on the first day, you have some uncertainty set, but on the second day, maybe your uncertainty set is different, right? Maybe the maybe the person who's undergoing the radiation is more calm now. He's not like. He's like breathing more calmly, so the uncertainty is smaller. So we, he, he created this uh, algorithm that had, had, where the uncertainty set is updated over time. And what he showed was that this uncertainty set converges in some, the, the optimal values and the optimal, the optimal solutions and the optimal values, V1, W1, they converge to the optimal, to converge to the optimal solution of the solution set and the optimal solution of the uncertainty set as well. So this one is uh, this Valborn message thing that I, I mentioned at the very beginning, right? So this is a singleton, a singleton point. So this is what this this kind of applied problem is actually what inspired this research. I think in Valibor's work, what he used was, I don't know if you're familiar with Danzig's work from 1956 or something, the continuity, the continuity of the minimum set. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that paper from, from Danzig, I think 19, 1950 something, where he showed uh, Kuratowski convergence for, I think for if the sets converge and there's some sense of convergence. So he used that one, and I, I kind of was looking through, scanning through the literature for, for more for work related to this, and that's how I came came about to see your work from Mathevoir. And this is the app, this is the application. But what what I was looking at was uh, how does this uncertainty set how is this uncertainty set change and how does it affect your optimal solution, right? So that's basically what generated this. And now what we kind of want to look at is, uh, yes, in a healthcare application, how, how does the change of uncertainty set affect the, the value, right? And also you want to look at stability properties, right? So if you, let's say you have an uncertainty set here, you generate for your, for your healthcare research for when, you, when you're preparing for the patient. But in reality, the patient's maybe uncertainty set is slightly different. You don't want, you don't want your, your, you know, prop, your values to be wildly different, right? That'd be really bad, they're really bad for the patient, right? If the patient doesn't breathe in an uncertain way exactly the way you plan for it, then you might have something that's completely bad for your patient. So that's, that's one application. And in more general, um, we wanna look at computational, computational problems too. Let's say, I, and this came up in, I think might have been related to this, but let's say you have, uh, just, a, just a linear programming problem, a linear programming problem where you have your constraint, constraints here and you generate your constraints around it. Let's say you have an approximation for it. You want to be able to ensure that your approximation does converge to your, to your solution set, right? Or, or how sharp your, your solution has to be, right? So this is, this is, uh, this is related. So uh, let's, let's look at not LP, but robust optimization. So you have an uncertainty set U and you have this uh, bounding, bounding sets here. Uh, yeah, so we want to look at approximations to this uncertainty set. Yeah, so this is, this is like one of the, one of the, applica the two, two applications that we were kind of considering, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I would like to say that uh, this may be considered as our homework, so our mm. task, mm -hmm. or part of this. Uh, it is, uh, Really interesting. Uh, the, uh, I, I was uh, looking at the, the fourth question mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes you have a natural index x mm -hmm. set. Excuse me. Yeah. For example, if you consider some uh, approximation yeah. theorem, mm -hmm. uh, theorem uh, some uh, approximation problem. Uh, for example, um, if you uh, try to find a uh, uniform uh, best approximation of a given function by polynomials or mm -hmm. something like that. In these kinds of problems, uh, the index uh, set is given in quite natural, so mm -hmm. you cannot uh, touch it uh, too much. Mm -hmm. But it is true that there are other problems 
uh, when the constraints are uh, the important thing and not how you uh, label mm -hmm. the constraints. Yeah. So in this case, uh, if you have the uh, problem and the Bertard problem, yeah. what you say is that you can, let's say, relabel yeah. both problems mm -hmm. in the sense that you reduce the distance yes, between yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And since some constants only depend on the coefficients and yeah. not on the indexes, yeah. you may, with the same uh, uh, without perturbing essentially the problems, yeah. you uh, reduce the distance, yeah. mm -hmm. then you sharpen yeah. the results. Yeah. I, I find this uh, really interesting. Yeah. And um, we will um, give you later some references about some uh, qualitative papers uh, in a different context when there is no uh, index set so important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, uh, we have considered uh, constraints depending on the parameter mm -hmm. and there is a particular case when the parameter is the same yeah. constraint set. Mm -hmm. So uh, in th in this is quite related to, to the house of distance mm -hmm. but uh, in, in a qualitative context, yeah. not quantitative, not mm -hmm. digits context. Mm -hmm. So, um, maybe we can discuss later yeah. about mm -hmm. this. So, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Is there any comments? Or? I, I think it is good uh, for PhD students to see a PhD student. Uh, so, uh, this is good. And uh, we are jealous of your oh, no. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't speak Spanish. So. <laughs> okay, so yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.